Hi everybody, this is James Craig here with Mini Masterworks, and welcome to the third part of my video series on painting this water tower for use in modern or post-apocalyptic games like Last Days or uh, Batman Miniatures game, uh, any, any real kind of city or uh, even rural table can use a water tower. So far we've done some work on the platform section that I've added uh, with some rust and wood weathering techniques, and today we're going to work on tackling the water tower part up at the top, the the water container. There we go. Uh, as you can see so far, um, I've done several of the same things that I did in the previous video. Uh, I gave it a coat of primer and then added some random rust tones on top. Uh, I spattered a bit of uh, rust color paint on there and then dragged it down for a little bit of streaking. This is the underpainting stage and will form the basis of the rust underneath of our chips, our scrapes, and everything else that we're going to add to this thing today. Uh, we're going to use a couple of methods that we haven't used in the previous videos uh, to give a greater variety of textures and surfaces uh, to this piece. So uh, without further ado, let's, uh, let's get at this. So when painting this piece, I gathered a lot of reference uh, online. I looked at a lot of pictures of water towers from, from around the world. Um, and I kept a, a small file of some of my favorites. Uh, they're the ones that you'll see uh, floating above me over here. And uh, with, uh, with those in mind, I, I gave some real thought as to what I wanted the overall look of this tower to be. Um, I could have left it pretty much entirely rusty, but I really wanted to build it up a bit. And one of the things I also wanted to do was to incorporate uh, the name of a town on there. Now, my son and I uh, really enjoy playing the Batman Miniatures game together, so I've decided to add the uh, town name of Gotham to the tower, and with that, uh, we'll have a few interesting tricks and techniques and a few, uh, a few shortcuts uh, in there as well that can help you create some pretty cool stuff. We're going to paint the water tower uh, predominantly white. Uh, that will really allow us to show a lot of cool rust techniques, and again, as you can see from some of my references, uh, the white ones can look pretty darn cool. So giving a bit of thought as to uh, rust patterns, placement, and so forth, and also giving a little thought ahead as to what else I want to do to make this piece extra special. Uh, my son and I have a few fun little uh, uh, nods and winks to several of our favorite uh, pop culture references to, uh, to hide into this tower as well. So uh, we're going to start out by uh, airbrushing a black segment across part of the water tower. Uh, the reason for it is we need to create uh, a background color for our lettering, and then we're going to mask that in a special way. So let's, uh, let's get a little bit of spraying done, and then I'll be able to show you how we're going to proceed. Okay, so I started out by masking off the area above and below uh, where my letters will go with uh, washi tape, or as some people call it, uh, tamaya tape. It's this yellow modeler's tape. It's uh, not super tacky, so it doesn't... Uh, tend to damage the paint underneath it. Uh, it's a great, great little product to have in your workstation for sure. Uh, next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to spray uh, this uh, heavy chipping fluid uh, onto this area. And then once I get that on, I'm going to spray that whole area black. The black will give me the mask that I need to make the, uh, or give me the surface that I need to mask to protect those letters. You'll see. All right, so. Uh, I sprayed on uh, some, let's see if you can see the surface on there. I sprayed on some chipping fluid. And then in a section there, I've sprayed on the black that will go uh, to form my lettering. I chose a really flat black because I felt that that would fit well with uh, the type of weathering I did. Uh, so I used uh, Black Bite by Legendary, great flat paint. Uh, but, you know, really any, any black or whatever color you want your lettering to be, could have done it in red. We just spray some of that on there. Nothing too tricky so far. Now this is where things get a little weird. So when I'm filming this, this is during our uh, lockdown during the COVID uh, pandemic. So uh, normally what I'd like to use next would be rubber cement, but I don't have any on hand. Now, given that this thing's gonna be treated pretty roughly, I've decided that I'm going to use hot glue in this particular case instead. I've got these great little letters that I picked up at a dollar store. They're just little wooden craft letters. 
And uh, you can get similar things at art supply stores like Michael's, but I always suggest checking your dollar store for cool things. Um, and sometimes I use these, I'll put them on a piece of uh, uh, tape or I'll put them on uh, frisket or something like that and cut a stencil around them. But in this particular case, I'm actually just gonna use the letters themselves as the stencil. So I'm gonna put a little bit of glue on the back. I'm actually gonna glue these to the black area. I'll, uh, I'll show you what it looks like in a minute. Now, when I remove these, if I was using rubber cement, it would be actually fairly gentle on the paint underneath. As it is, I'm only gonna use a really tiny amount of hot glue. And if it does damage the paint underneath a little bit, no big deal, it's gonna be roughed up and, uh, and chipped anyway, so this will be okay. I'll just be doing it carefully with very little amounts, just enough to hold them in place so that when I spray over them, they will maintain that black and not allow the new color of paint, the white, to, uh, to penetrate. So that's where we're going next. I'm gonna set this up and I'll give you a quick peek at it. And just moments later, we have letters attached to the tower. So what next? How do we go from here? And why did you do the uh, resist on this area before the black and not do the whole thing that way. Well, I wasn't sure if the tape would remove some of the uh, chipping fluid, some of the rusting fluid. So I was, I was a little concerned that if I didn't uh, do the taping first and the, to get these both this area of black mapped in and these letters on nice and straight, uh, I was afraid that the tape might remove some of my chipping fluid. So now I'm gonna remove the tape. I'm gonna spray the whole thing in chipping fluid and then we can start spraying it white. Uh, so, airbrush is away. Okay, so I have sprayed the uh, canister part of the tower with the uh, chipping fluid, which you can see uh, drying there now. But for the roof section, I've decided to use a different technique in addition to uh, a little bit of chipping fluid. So I've, I've roughly sprayed a bit of chipping fluid on there uh, when I was doing the first uh, application so that it would dry uh, in plenty of time for this. I want to add another technique that will give us a slightly different texture on this flat section on top where the sun beats down. So on my palette here, I've just got a little bit of water. I use paint water because it's slightly tinted. I figured that would be easier for you guys to see on camera. And it really doesn't matter for what we're doing. So I'm going to kind of go in the center of some of these panels, and maybe a little along the edge. So I think that in the examples that I saw, there's a lot of deterioration, kind of kind of like on the, the roof of a car that's been sitting too long in the sun. A lot of the centers of these panels get hotter and baked in more. Um, you can also see, let's see, well, if you can't see that on the camera or not, um, there's a little bit of texture already in the roof of this uh, that was created with our, our super glue and sponge uh, texturing technique that I showed you in a previous video and uh, also the the metal roof itself wasn't fully uh, wasn't completely even when when I started so uh, we're gonna have lots and lots of textures both implied and actual in this piece so I've added a bunch of water to the centers of the panels and a little bit down along the bottoms nothing really scientific here and I've got this bowl ooh, monsters uh, I've got this bowl full of kosher uh, salt and little bits of other things that have uh, collected in it over time as I use it for this. This is called a uh, salt masking technique. And what I'm going to do is I'm gonna let some of these crystals of salt stick to the water I just put on there. And they will also act as a mask much in the same way that our lettering is doing. So when I spray the paint on here, we'll have all of these little uneven spaces. And it's okay if some of it gets down on the other stuff. That's why I wanted to do this while it was wet so I could also capture a little bit of the salt in the chipping fluid that is there. Yeah, I'm gonna put a little bit more in that. That feels pretty good. So now we've got kind of a combination of chipping fluid and salt weathering happening here, which I think give us some pretty interesting results. And that's really what we're looking for is visual interest, right? Creating a piece that gives you more to look at the more that you do look. Just a little bit more here in the back. 
All right. Now I'm not going to use the hair dryer to speed up the drying on this because quite frankly, I don't want to blow it all off right away. The airbrush is going to blow some of it off uh, when we go to paint, but uh, mm, like a big Gotham pretzel. <laughs> so you can also use uh, smaller grain salts if you want. Uh, sometimes it's nice to have a bit of a mixture. I've got a little bit of a mixture in here, but this is mostly kosher. I'm just going to get a little bit of the smaller stuff from the bottom here. See if I can get down at that. Just get even a little bit more variation in there. Nothing really special about this. There we go, down with some of those smaller grains. There we go. All right. That's starting to feel good. There we go. Even saltier. So, with our tower now thoroughly salted, I'm going to have to let it actually dry. It won't take very long. And then I'm going to fire up the airbrush and start spraying over top of this. I'll give you a kind of a work in progress shot, but nobody needs to watch me just sitting there spraying. So I'll give you a work in progress shot and then we'll, we'll kind of cut to what's next. Okay, so I've started the spraying process. You can see so far I've focused on the area around the letters to make sure that they get uh, filled in all the way around from the various angles. I think this is going to work quite well. You can also see how the paint, let me see if I can move this here, uh, how the paint uh, collects behind, oops, behind some of the salt, or sorry, on the salt, so that when I brush any of that salt away, you can see that the space underneath is left the, the undercoat, um, the, the rust in this particular case here. I'm just going to knock a couple of them off for fun. There we go. Now we can see that, I believe. See, there's some really kind of random chips. Now, up in these areas where there's a lot of salt, it's going to be a lot of corrosion in that area. And so I think this is going to work out quite well. So I'm going to keep going with the spraying. Uh, right now, I'm just using uh, Moro White by P3 and a little bit of Steinle Res White as well. Uh, from Badger because they're two white paints that I like that spray really well and will give me kind of a little bit of variation in the surface. The Steinle Res is a little more matte, so I'm going to be using that more on the top, again, in these kind of like sun-baked areas. And I figure that the coating on a uh, water tower would be, even if it's, you know, badly, badly damaged by the sun and the elements, would still have at least a little bit of satin where it would have been probably high gloss to begin with. So that's why I use the, the Moro White for the, for the facings. So we're just going to keep going with that, and I'll be back in a couple minutes with the rest of this thing sprayed. Okay, and we're back. So I let this, uh, I sprayed it, and then I let it dry uh, at least long enough to clean my airbrushes. Uh, not a long time, uh, but, uh, you know, due diligence with the airbrush really pays off later, right? So now that I've got this here, um, my next step is going to be to take a, a stiff brush, uh, you could use a toothbrush if you want, a uh, Wolverine toothbrush, why not? Um, and the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to start by brushing off gently. Maybe a little scrubbing, looks good. So we start brushing off the salt and as we brush that off, we get some really interesting multi-layer uh, oops, let's see if I can do this better. We get some really interesting multi-layer uh, look to our chipping. Uh, places where a little bit of paint has captured underneath the uh, uneven shapes of the salt and some places where uh, they come off as, as solid chips. So I'm just going to keep working this for a couple of minutes and see where it takes me. Um, and the other thing is that uh, these letters are about to come off too, which is uh, going to be pretty fun. Now, I like using the salt method for, for big things. Uh, I know some people use it on smaller scale miniatures as well. Um, if you're doing something that has like a lot of corrosion or big corrosion, it can be fantastic. What I really like about it is this um, the fact that as it comes off and as you use a tool, uh, 
a, a stiff brush to take it off, you can actually also use it as an abrasive itself and you get some really great, see if you can focus there, you can get some really great multi-layered kind of natural looking uh, effects. Um, that being said, a lot of people also find uh, things like the kosher salt just just too big. The, the, the chunks, the chips are too big for a lot of what they're working on. But for this, uh, for this water tower, I, I thought it was going to be uh, pretty perfect. I want to I want to remind people that the techniques I'm showing, I may be using them on terrain today, but I could be using them on my next Golden Demon or competition project, you know, later. Uh, it's not uh, these things are not single use. There are lots of places to do this kind of stuff. And a lot of the uh, a lot of the chipping and weathering techniques that I use, um, I learned from looking at historical modeling. So there's there's lots of things, uh, lots of tricks and and uh, and interesting ideas in in all facets of modeling, uh, from terrain to historicals to fantasy. It, it's it's all there, and there are so many skills, and there's always something new to learn. So, you know, for me it's really important to be able to kind of give back to the community because of all the people that I've been able to learn really cool things from. So uh, I hope that you guys are enjoying this stuff uh, with Mini Masterworks. Uh, there's a lot of other videos out there that are, that are pretty neat as well. Now here I've removed the lettering from my piece. Now you can see that it's a little soft around the edges, but that's totally okay. Basically we wanted that mask to give us uh, you know, a stencil effect, a, a thing that we can work with to uh, really get that lettering in and get what's called uh, ghost signage or ghost lettering. Uh, old buildings, and there's, there's some great groups on Facebook for this too, but old buildings often have things painted on them. Sometimes it's a painting over a painting because that's the way a lot of advertisements used to be done. Um, with things like the water towers, um, we really want this very kind of faded lettering and this is going to work out just great. Uh, this is exactly what I was hoping for. So we'll see, we'll see where that leads us to. So I'm going to take a couple more minutes here to uh, clean off my salt. And uh, then because I'm kind of putting salt everywhere, I'm going to take a couple minutes to clean up my workspace a little bit. We'll see where the weathering takes us from there. So a few more minutes. Uh, just a, just as an aside, uh, these are the first videos I've ever done for a company. I've been approached in the past, but this is the first time I've ever said, you know what, I'm I'm going to do that. And so I I have a tendency to just kind of cut and come back to the next step rather than making you watch me all the way through. But if you want to throw something in the comments, let me know if that uh, system and process is something that, that you enjoy, because I have a feeling... Uh, uh, Mini Masterworks and I may be doing a couple more other videos in the future. Uh, and if not with them, you know, maybe just on my own as well. But if you can let me know if this format works for you in the comments, that would be great. And uh, while you're at it, the Mini Masterworks channel would love you to like and subscribe. Hey, my son is going to get a laugh out of me doing that. All right, so I'm going to keep going with this uh, cleanup and abrasion. And uh, I'll, I'll check back in with you to show you the results of what I'm doing right now. Okay, so I've removed most of the salt. We have some great starts to our effects. All right. So next, I'm going to take a little bit of a high grit sandpaper. And on a lot of the, uh, uh, the visuals that I've collected of water towers, like this one, I don't know if that worked or not. Hopefully it did. Um, I, uh, I see that a lot of the uh, way that the paint goes tends to be uh, in, a, in a vertical, sometimes a horizontal, but mostly it follows that vertical path of, of rain and water washing down it. So I'm going to just lightly abrade ooh, good bird, uh, this just a little bit in a couple areas before I start doing the, the water effects. This will help break that surface up. And so that when I start doing the chipping with the water, uh, with a little luck, it will also help the chipping to flake and pull a little bit in the ways that I want it to. 
I'm not going to do this everywhere. I'm going to be very, very gentle with this. I don't want to, you know, turn this into a weird, uh, unnatural finish. I want this to just further enhance in a few of these areas. All right. So next I'm going to grab a big soft brush. Oh, there's one I like. This one's a natural hair fiber, holds a lot of water. Very, very easy. And I think I'm going to start, you know what, I'm going to start at the bottom. I'm not sure if that's really the, the right decision or not, but it's the one I'm going to make. I'm going to start on this bottom section a little bit. And I figure from my references that this will have uh, a stronger concentration of paint on it than some of the other areas, but still collects a lot of uh, rust streaks and whatnot. So because I'm going to be doing the streaking last, I'm going to start with this area so that this area will have the most time to kind of set up and be, uh, be ready for further techniques. Uh, then I'm just going to grab Kind of a medium stiffness paintbrush, just an artist brush here. I'm just going to start dragging and brushing as that water begins to go through my layers and uh, and break down the chipping fluid underneath. So we'll see how this goes here. I mean, some of that is clearly running up onto the other parts, which is fine. We'll be getting to them in just a minute anyway. And I'm going to grab this brush. I, I like this one. It's a, uh, I think it's for cleaning bottles or something, but it's a, uh, it's a nylon brush and all those little edges on it. I like to roll them across my paint surfaces. I find that they do a really interesting abrasion that, uh, gives me very kind of loose, random patterns. So right there, we've gone from basically this to that in no time flat. And I quite like that look. So I'm gonna go back. I'm gonna start uh, uh, grabbing some, some regular, oh, there we go, that's the one I wanted. Some regular old paint brushes. And I think that that uh, chipping fluid is now more ready, more dissolved. Sometimes you just gotta give it a little bit of time. And, uh, and I'm just working, working across the surfaces here uh, in the direction that I want my streaking to go and in the direction that I hope my chips will begin to pull. So from here down, largely. And that seems to be coming along quite nicely. I'm going to grab my water brush, which I left up here, <laughs> and I'm going to start working on that center section next. Now this should be kind of interesting. We'll see how our letters come out. The, uh, the intent will be to go back to those letters afterwards and use some, use some black to help kind of pick them out in a way that is uh, in keeping with our weathering but we definitely have to do some, some wear and tear there too. Now, a special place to pay attention to is anything that's a, that's a seam, uh, like the weld line up the side of the tower here. This is a spot that will clearly have more, uh, more weathering and more attention than other places because it's a place where water and elements will, will naturally collect. Oh, my brush is, uh, Poor old pony hair brush here is uh, getting ready for the glue factory. I think it's uh, it's on its last legs. It's starting to shed bristles, which is fine, I guess, for this. But uh, I'll have to make sure that I make sure that I get all of those bristles off afterwards. So let's uh, let's take our our nylon brush. We'll just do a little bit of rolling just to make some. Some random damage. One of the nice things about this stage too is that 
as the paint begins to break down, you can see that it also leaves behind deposits of, well, broken down paint. So we've got little bits of black and brown making their way as a stain across the surface of the white, which is perfect. Exactly what we're hoping will happen in most cases here. I want to make sure I leave some of the chips and some of the chipped areas as, as the salt created them. But I also want to really work some of them to, to become bigger, more open, rusted zones. We are um, going to make this piece substantially more rust than it is paint by the end. That's my goal anyway. And that gives us a really cool surface to go back onto to add some graffiti and uh, other decorative elements too. So I don't want to overwork around the, the letters because we want them to look like letters and to be able to be legible. So I'm going to be very careful in how I approach those areas. But that being said, they do have to be weathered as well. So you got to take some chances here and there. Um, I'm going to grab a different tool for a minute. I'm going to grab, oh, there it is right there. This is a, a pointed sharp tool. Uh, you could really use a ball burnisher or something like that for this as well. Um, maybe, maybe I'll actually use the ball burnisher. It's got a kind of a more gentle edge to it. I'm going to use this to kind of, again, just scratch a little, uh, weaken the surface of the white a little bit maybe. And where it's really wet, let's see if I can do this like this. Where it's wet, you can actually produce some great tears and breakdown in the paint. And it gives you kind of a lot of control as to push and pull, but you also have to give up some control as to, you know, how much it will tear in any given spot. Uh, but in these really kind of wet zones that are weaker, I'm going to get some pretty cool things happening. So we're, we're slowly getting there. This also really helps me get up in kind of like under the, under the lip of here um, because it's harder to get your brushes and your tools in there. So having, having something that will help me break that up a little bit more is a good thing. And to be perfectly honest, I probably could have just thrown some more salt up in there. It probably would have been really helpful, but we'll get there. All right, I'm just working, working away. So I'm going to keep uh, working on uh, creating these rust effects with my brushes, uh, paint brushes, a little bit of scraping with a nylon brush, and a little bit of, of work with sharp points to weaken the paint. My, my regular brush can take advantage of those zones. All right. I'm just going to be picking away at this for probably 15, maybe 20 minutes tops. Uh, so I'll, uh, I'll show you what, what's in store next in just a couple of moments. Okay, so uh, a few minutes of scrubbing later and lots of little paint flecks all over my shirt. Um, I have produced a fairly uh, interesting rust pattern all the way around. I have still maintained the stenciling as the basis of the letters. I'll be working over those with paint later in my brush. Um, I want to do one more thing though, because I still feel that the white on this, even though I, I want a white tower, it still feels very white especially considering how uh, gnarly it is. So I'm just gonna take a little bit of a brown ink. Uh, this one is burnt umber, burnt umber, yes. And I'm just gonna add it into my old paint water. <laughs> nothing, nothing super special there. Uh, I could add a drop of black or a drop of gray, but I, I think the brown will be good for now. And I'm just gonna take some of that nasty old paint water with all the rest of its colors in it. And I'm just going to do just a little bit of a wash one time around. That 
flecked up a little bit, stain around some of these spots. I don't want to cover it evenly. I just want a little bit of a little bit of extra grunginess, as would be befitting such a weathered tower. I'm just gonna shove a little up in there. Why not? Let's see how that goes. And then I'm just gonna take a clean brush, or a relatively clean brush anyway. Uh, and I'm just going to streak from top to bottom just to remove some of the excess so it doesn't pool. I don't want any, I'm not trying to create my specific rust pools right now. I'm just trying to give this whole thing just a little bit of a dirtier finish. And I think this is going to work out just fabulously. Not a proper wash, certainly not anything I would consider to be like a, a complete ink wash. Just, just a tiny little bit of filter on that white to make the whole thing super grungy. I'm actually gonna, you know, we'll take a chance. We'll go back, we'll just put a little extra along our weld line. So I know I'm gonna be doing more there anyway. And that way, any drips that we see that that do kind of stain and stay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep this in a holder so it stays upright. Just a block of foam will do. Uh, I happen to have a thing here that holds brushes that I think it'll stand in just fine. And that way, any, any, streaks that we actually end up with, um, I can capitalize on those later uh, in planning where I'm going to put my more uh, specifically visible and accentuated rust. So now we've got slightly less bright white, nice and grungy. Now I'm not loving this spot right here. I really kind of rubbed too much away. So I've got two choices now. Um, I could let this dry and then I could put on a little bit more chipping fluid, a little more white paint and just fix it again. Uh, or I'm pretty sure I'm going to be putting some pretty significant graffiti there anyway. So I'm not sure that it really matters all that much. So I'm going to, I'm just going to think on that a little bit while this is, uh, while this is drying, but man, that's a lot of rust and a pretty effective, uh, technique for what we're after. Now, to be perfectly honest, these techniques that I'm using today, uh, like I said, they can be used for lots of things. You don't have to have like this massively uh, super rusty over the top kind of look. These techniques, especially the chipping fluid, can be used very carefully to do much smaller things as well. Um, they can also be used to show uh, if you have a paint job that has multiple layers, uh, like uh, a lot of historical tanks will have uh, if you chip all the way through, you'll get, you'll get the metal that rusts, you'll get a primer coat, and then you'll get a top coat. You can, you can use this to, to help create and really work carefully through, uh, multiple layers as well. And there are of course other ways we can, we can paint the chips in. We'll probably do a bit of that, uh, before this is over too, uh, entirely with a brush. But, uh, for this kind of like larger scale, great big, uh, post-apocalyptic gas lands, last days, what have you. Um, I really wanted it to look, I wanted it to look beat. And so we've got, we've got a lot of rust. We've got a lot of effects here and we're going to have to give this a bit of time to dry. So like most good projects, I guess it's time to do a bit of uh, cleanup and let it do its thing. We'll come back and film the rest of this in a bit. All right. We're sufficiently dry to carry on. So in my palette, I've put uh, Vallejo Model Air uh, Orange Rust. Automaton Gray by Legendary Paints, Black Bite by Legendary Paints, uh, Camo Black Brown by Vallejo, and also a little bit of Steinle Res White Primer because it's a great strong white. So with these colors in my palette, I'm going to carry on a little bit further now. This is the part where I'm going to grab one of my brushes. And the first thing I really want to address is our Gotham lettering because right now it looks like it's made pretty much entirely of the rust from behind Whereas what we want is we want a weathered uh, Black writing across there. So mostly in the next Little steps here. I'm going to be working with the with the black and the uh, gray paint So I don't have to thin things too much here um, But what I really want to do let's see if I can Figure out where my best spot for the camera is so what I really want to do now is I want to paint in these letters, but I want to paint them in an uneven 
manner using uh, basically a stippling technique. Lots and little dots and dashes of paint to go in the areas where I have laid out this lettering. So I'm going to start with the H and the A here in the middle and kind of work my way around. Probably would have made more sense to start at one end and work my way across, but sense. That's crazy talk. Let's see where I get with that. Now, uh, we want this to read as worn paint, not as, uh, not as a repaint. And uh, so I'm going to start with the black here and kind of make the, the loose bulk of my, my chips of black so that it gives the impression of it being uh, the, the color that's intended there. So just a little bit more right there. This paint is so beautifully flat that it's going to work great for this. All right. So let's look at that there. So you can see I'm really just kind of loosely throwing that in there, uh, trying to maintain some kind of uh, cohesion to the letter so they also don't end up looking sloppy. Uh, they would have been cleanly stenciled on there. So now I'm going to go through and I'm going to like really shore up some of those edges just nice and sharp. So that there is no question of intent. All right. Then I'm going to take some of the camo black brown color. It's a it's a very dark again, fairly flat finish paint. Um, it's one of my favorite colors to work with. It's rich, and kind of putting it in with the black will let me really solidify these letters without getting rid of the entire concept that there is rust and wear. We don't want the black to be such a pure black that it feels like it was a later addition than all of this worn white. So let's shore that up just a little bit. Getting there. Um, so not much to, to see or to say yet, but we will work our way along. Now, the center of that A, I think, is kind of problematic. So I'm just going to go back with a little bit of the, the Steinle Res White and I'm going to paint in tiny chips and lines into the center of that A to reestablish it so that again doesn't look like we've just gone crazy with our weathering but rather we have worn an intentional lettering and I'll just shore up around a couple of these other edges while I'm at it let's just Dab a little bit more in there. Tiny little marks, tiny little work. This is kind of the, the part that for me is less fun, but I find very relaxing. Uh, doing all the doing all the big chipping stuff is exciting and it's fun and it's like, ooh, what's gonna happen? With this, because I am effectively just doing normal miniature painting. You know, careful uh, technical work. It uh, it's less exciting or less surprising. But the ability to to take my time and and just plug away at stuff like this is uh, something I find particularly relaxing. It's a big part of why I enjoy this hobby. And results well, the results are pretty solid once you. Get a little bit of practice. I'm just going to put one more little right there. Maybe throw a little bit of mark of white in the back of some of this black. Not too much. Just enough to give the impression of, of wear. And here, the letter A is starting to look a little bit more like the rest of the tower come together. I'm pretty happy with the way it's looking in the middle of the A there. I'll go back and reinforce that a little bit more as I go. 
Um, but I'm going to take a few minutes now and I'm going to, I'm going to block in the rest of these letters so then we can see what kinds of other effects we need to accomplish. Uh, I'm going to use a little bit of the gray along the way, again, to help break up the black and to give me a little bit of, of the impression of chipping or uh, wear in the black, but not so much that it looks like there's just kind of dabs of gray everywhere. Subtlety. It's got to be, it's got to be subtle if it's going to work well. A little bit of that. All right, so carrying on, we will press forward. Uh, look on camera, I don't like the gray along the one spot there, so I'm going to fix that up too. And uh, keep checking my work as I go. So lots of little painting for the next few minutes. So here we are a few minutes later, and now we have our letters reestablished. If I show you this up close, you can see I've made a few uh, messes. I mean... I was only so careful when I was doing this, but it really doesn't matter because part of the next step will help uh, clean up any extra edges or anything you uh, need to adjust. So I'm going to adjust the position of the camera so you can see my brushwork up close, and we'll figure out how to turn these letters back into something befitting of the rest of the tower, like this. All right. So you can see my hands are already getting pretty messy from painting. I know it's a bad habit, one that several painters have. I am one of them. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a little bit of uh, chipping techniques that are painted on uh, rather than physical chipping like the, the hairspray stuff or the uh, chipping fluid. And uh, again, in my palette, I've got uh, an orange rust, a gray, a black, a dark brown, a bit of white. So all the colors that we need for this. So I'm going to start here on my G. Uh, because that's the part that you guys can see pretty well. And the first thing I'm doing is I'm going to grab some of this black-brown. And I'm going to go through and I'm going to look... First I'm going to look and see where some of the chips underneath were that I still like the looks of, that I want to maybe accent a little bit. And uh, just add a little more water in there. There we go. And uh, I'm also going to make some decisions about where my chips are going to cross right onto my letters themselves. Okay, we don't want to create anything that has a, a particularly regular shape or finish. We want everything to feel uh, like it organically happened without great planning. So I'm just going to go back in. I see some great little chipping areas that were there. A little in there. We don't want to do anything that's going to overly disrupt the shape of our letters, too. We want to make sure that they're still really legible. And it's okay if your coverage is a little uh, thin in spots. It's going to actually help if you have a bit of a variety of, of finishes. Now, I'm trying to get some really small stuff happening now. So people tell me all the time, oh, my hand shakes. I, so much trouble painting because of the, the shake in my hands. Well, if you're doing chipping, shaking hands can be a really handy thing, actually. All right. Yeah, I'm a big one here. There, I think that looks like a good spot. I'm going to add a little bit more brown to that, right in breaking into that black. And since we already had a lot of the chipping coming right up to the edge of the black here, I think I'm just going to carry that through the black. And without even cleaning my brush, I'm going to pick up some of this orange rust color. And I'm going to mix it right into that wet brown paint, dark brown paint. Dab a little inside of some of these chips that I just made. Some of these zones. Find is that the rust effect is pretty believable pretty quick and will be in keeping with the colors we unveiled from underneath because both this black brown and this orange rust color were part of the original rust colors that I sprayed on this thing. So it all creates a good sense of harmony. Just put a 
little in there. And because it's kind of fun to do, I'm going to dampen my brush, a little bit of water, and since I haven't cleaned off that rust from my brush yet, I don't want to create too many rust streaks. We're going to be doing more of that with the enamel product. I'll rinse that off. A little bit of extra staining can be quite pleasant in this stage, so I'm just going to then have a little water and let that just kind of bleed out and around a little bit. Plus, I mean, we've already put some, some filters of dirty paint water on the rest of the paint. We might as well convince this to match. I'm just going to grab a soft brush here. That one's pretty soft. So I'll just gently tap some of that color around. So now we're getting back to a really harmonious finish with our chips and our rusting. Go back and insist a little bit more of the dark brown. In a couple of spots. We've got a well-weathered G. camera there that looks like it fits in the rest of our tower a little bit of gray in a couple of spots just to accentuate the edges of some of those chips just a little bit makes me happy not necessary but a little bit of breakup a little bit of scratches nothing too significant just got a white right back into the middle And a touch of rust. And there we go. I quite like the way that is starting to look. So I think I'm going to move over to the G. Same thing. I'm just going to start with a, a bit of my dark brown. I'll look for spots where we've already got kind of breaks right up to the edge. Overlap them a bit, and I go back and look for spots where the brown chips are really showing through the white where I painted over. And we'll put them back. Nothing too precious, nothing too careful, just using the tip of my brush to make some marks and some cracks in the paint. Very small stuff. It's the little things, isn't that what they say? And we'll get right here. Don't lose track of the fact that I'm supposed to be working primarily on the O right now. <laughs> I just kind of Sometimes go wandering with the brush. And some more little chips in here. I feel like Bob Ross right now. What's that? Just some happy little chips. Nothing too intense. Let's see if I can get this closer so you can see even better. Have a little bit of fun. See where the shake in your hand takes you. Happy little chips. Let me go all the way up here. <laughs> a big one. That's a big spot right there. All right. Now, in without even cleaning my brush, pick up some of that orange paint, orange rust, and just start... Oops, shouldn't have wiped it off first. Pick up some of that orange rust and start tossing it right in the middle of some of these big brown chips. Get that in the mix. bit of water and I'll just kind of re -sand. 
soften the edges of those with a little bit of water. We get some texture. We also don't get garish paint blobs. Oops. If you make a little mistake, no big deal. A little bit of dirty paint water. Drag it down vertically. Grab a soft brush. Clean that sucker up while well, leaving really excellent streaks and effects. I don't know what the best uh, position is with this, but give me the best look I can, folks. If, uh, if you find this kind of like close-up camera stuff useful, let me know. If uh, you really prefer me not doing this kind of stuff, let me know. Like I said, these are my first set of videos. Uh, that I've decided to do, and uh, great thanks to the people at uh, Mini Masterworks for for this opportunity. And while I'm at it, I might as well send a shout out to uh, my son, uh, who's not only the inspiration for a lot of this work, but is also uh, my video editor. So I think this looks pretty good. It was put together by a 12-year-old. <laughs> might be 13 by the time you see this video, but uh, he's got his own YouTube channel, uh, JD Skeletor's uh, Pops and Games, and uh, you guys can give them a check out if you like. Uh, covers Funko Pops. He'll be covering some miniature war game stuff like Batman soon. Also doing some uh, customization work on uh, Funko Pops and that kind of thing. Uh, he would love to have some more subscribers, so... Might as well give him a plug for uh, for all his hard work. And a special thanks to you, son. Uh, without him, I probably wouldn't be doing this right now. Because uh, I don't know how to edit videos worth a darn. <laughs> I'm going to throw a little bit more white into a couple of these stains. Just a little makes me happy. The other thing I can do is I can go along the bottom edge of a few of these chips, just with the tip of my brush again. Just putting a little highlight at the bottom of some of your chips can really make them stand out and pop and look really great and three-dimensional. And uh, this is usually something I do right at the end is throw in a couple more little highlights under things, but Right now, I just feel like doing a little, just a little bit. Take my mostly clean soft brush and just drag that sucker down. Looking good. This filthy water is fantastic for what I'm doing right now. There we go. Look at that. Right now, I've got a clean dish of water just over here. Actually, you know what? I'm going to refill this. A little extra clean water. And we'll just streak some of that down. There are effects that are worth controlling. There are effects that are worth just letting happen. And this is a spot where the paint water is such a great color right now. I just feel like letting a little bit of this happen and see where it goes. There we go. So, we've gone from some uh, almost disappeared letters. Oh, still got the H to do. <laughs> uh, to ones that look like they belong, that are bold enough to read, but are weathered enough to look like they belong as part of this tower. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to finish up the H. And then I'm going to uh, uh, clear coat this and uh, uh, to protect all the work that we've done so far. So I think that uh, I'll do one more video for you guys on this tower and it will be the enamel detailing and some graffiti. 
But for now, I think we've got a very well weathered tower using uh, salt chip technique as well as chipping fluid and then going back through and uh, brush chipping uh, some of the letters in a way that is harmonious with the rest. Uh, the next video I think will be probably the best one of the entire set because uh, there's going to be the most number of techniques and the most fun uh, techniques. So come on back one more time uh, with Mini Masterworks for my tutorial on uh, enamel weathering, uh, weathering powders, and most importantly, graffiti. See you next time, folks. Thank <laughs> you.